So this comes from Andy Chen at Embark Lifestyle. How do you guys apply acute to chronic workload ratio principles to barbell sports? So uh, a little plug, we had Tim Gabbett on the podcast a little while ago. That episode's in queue because he's going to be doing a webinar for us next year. So we'll release that a little bit closer to the date. <clears throat> but um, um, for that. Yeah. So, I mean, I am too. Tim's super, like super smart, obviously, but also super um, down to earth, just easy to get along with and cares a lot about making sure that uh, good information is being disseminated and, you know, helping people out. So um, I don't think, and you guys can, can chime in if I'm off base or if I'm right, but <clears throat> I don't think that we have any uh, data specific to barbell sports as of yet. It's been mostly field sport athletes, right? Um, so everything is kind of an inference. And so we're making best guesses right now until we've got some better evidence to, to inform that. But if, if it seems like an acute to chronic workload ratio issue, there's nothing crazy, no red flags, no big traumatic mechanism injury, and we can kind of rule those out comfortably, then uh, I like to look back at uh, an athlete's training log. So I'll do this when I'm coaching athletes in general. Um, and also if I'm seeing someone in clinic, I'll ask them, hey, next time I see you, bring your you know, training log if you have one and let's go back. Uh, I don't know, as far back as is relevant. Like I probably don't need to sift through an, a year's worth of training data, but um, maybe as, as far as is relevant uh, in terms of the issue that they're currently faced with. So if, if their problem started a month ago, let's look at last month and the month before, maybe the month before that, just to get a feel for how things are. And I'm mostly interested in the movements that are most affected and other ones, <clears throat> other movements that are using those same body parts because it's all going to generate some sort of stress on the affected um, body part. And then it's just some simple math, you know, kind of figuring out what's the the average intensity, the average volume, uh, maybe some peak volume, peak intensities, that sort of thing. Um, and then figuring out, okay, we were working with these numbers before. <clears throat> Your issue started about here. This is the progression. So, and then any accounting for any other additional information, like you continue to train this way and this is how you felt while you did that. So then if it's a case of, let's say someone's been doing a lot and they haven't actually had a chance to let the body parts settle down, then I'm probably slashing their, their volume or their intensity uh, or both, depending on what seems to be the more, depending on what seems to be aggravating them the most. And it could be both, but it could be the case where they tell me, hey, anytime that I squat over 405, like my, my knee bugs me, but anything under that's fine. I'm like, okay, so we're, we're going to avoid squatting over 405 for a little bit and try to see if we can get some good work done in this sort of range. Or maybe it's not intensity dependent. Maybe it's the case where any, anytime I do, you know, five by fives or five by sevens or whatever, like that, that brings on the symptoms. Okay. There may be more of a volume threshold there. And so we'll figure out what the more likely scenarios are. And there's nothing wrong, I don't think, with changing both and, and undershooting. And again, this is a, a hypothetical situation where someone's not had a chance or not allowed themselves to settle down. So we want to give them that for a little bit of time and then start to gradually increase that over time, too. And I don't know if I picked this up from anywhere, but I think a 5 to 10 percent um, increase in, in volume from week to week may be a good idea. I probably won't increase intensity that that much that fast. Um, and if you guys have any better resources uh, or references for that, let me know. But, um, and then it's kind of tweaking based on how they respond. So if they're responding pretty well, then all right, let's go. I try to go for a linear progression as far as that's possible. Um, that's not always possible. So, um, that's fine. Then we take a few steps back and you kind of figure out <clears throat> what seems to be tolerated, what doesn't seem to be tolerated, but it, it comes down to, I think some simple math and, and combining that with your read on the situation based on the assessment. Um, if it's someone who hasn't, isn't in that sort of situation where they haven't let themselves settle, then, I mean, it's probably the case where they still have to reduce something, but maybe it doesn't have to be as drastic uh, of, a, of a reduction, maybe. I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Well, I think the, the, the question specifically, how do we apply the acute to chronic workload ratio to barbell sport athletes? I don't think we actually can directly because of what you said in the very beginning, Jared, which is that there is no data on barbell sport athletes currently. So just to take a step back from there, the acute to chronic workload ratio, if you're 
for the listeners who are not familiar with that, you're essentially taking a micro cycle of training, your most recent micro cycle, and that is usually a week for most people just because that's a convenient thing with the calendar, but you know, any, anywhere from seven to 10 days. So your most recent micro cycle over, and that's the amount of work, whatever metric that you're using to track training load. It could be tonnage, sets times reps times weight. It could be uh, arbitrary units is what they refer to in the literature as the session RPEs times the minutes times duration. They get a, a number or they get a value there and that's what they use for their AC ratios. Could be average intensity, absolute intensity, whatever metric, mileage, whatever metric you're using. So that metric of the most recent microcycle over a block of the past. So it could be the average of the past three weeks. It could be the average of the past four weeks, the average of the past five weeks, all have been used in studies. The limitation of barbell sport athletes, again, is that there is no zero data on that. The, the ratios that Tim Gabbett and others have found with AC ratios, like specific ratios looking at injury risk have come from sports like rugby, Australian rules, football, uh, cricket, soccer, so field sport athletes where they're tracking mostly practice time. Uh, and that, so that point can't be understated. And they found a sweet spot, you know, of ratio of 0.8 to 1.3 seems to be a nice area where you're not doing too little to make yourself deconditioned and increasing risk. You're not doing too much too soon, increasing risk. It's just right. It's like that Goldilocks analogy. We don't have that ratio for barbell sport athletes. And so you would need to just collect data on your own people and, and then, you know, retroactively kind of look back or prospectively create, you know, collect data and then look to see if people get hurt. And it's hard to control for that in your own gym. It's not a study. So what Tim, you know, we talked about that on the podcast is like, okay, well, what would be more valid? And it's just look at, if anything, look at their chronic work over time. So like AC ratio is all about preparation anyway. What are you doing now compared to what you have been prepared to do? And the big picture, no matter what, is to avoid acute spikes in either direction. So if you're going to triple your work this micro cycle compared to the average of what you've done over the past four or five weeks, just know that you're increasing your risk. Just sign off on that. Don't be surprised if something happens. You, nothing may happen. You may come out scot-free and your performance goes up and that's great. But just know that there, there may be a cost to that. If you're going to go on vacation for three weeks and you've decided that you're going to do absolutely nothing, sign off on the fact that you may decondition. And if you try to jump back right into training where you pick up where you left off, you've now deconditioned, you've leveled down and you're putting yourself at more risk, most likely. So just sign off on that. That's a conversation that has to be had. Um, and then ultimately it's the athlete's decision. You know, I, as far as the AC, there's another question. I don't know if it's here, but it was, you know, what do you want to see in the research? What new things do you mm -hmm. want to see in, in future research? And for me, it's this, it's the AC ratios with barbell sport athletes. And we've got at our gym, lucky enough, we have like 85 weightlifting only members at the gym. And uh, we're talking about collecting some data on them to see if we can get some some rough estimates just to see because I have no clue what those ratios will be and, and like what metric are you going to choose tonnage well in weightlifting it's about one rep maxes so maybe absolute intensity is what you're looking at you know all these there's a lot of questions but um, I think I think big picture with AC ratios or just training load monitoring in general is that you're you're looking for spikes either up or down and in the subjective you can maybe find those I call them I refer to them as inflection points you know like what happened around the time that you started to feel your issues. Did you change programs? Did you start your 10 by 10 German squat volume at the same time that you were training for the Boston oh, Marathon oh, yeah. or the CrossFit Open? You know, <laughs> uh, Did you change coaches? Did you change jobs where your sleep was affected? Maybe your training didn't change at all, but your life changed. And that's gonna fill your stress bucket up as well. So it's like, uh, you're, looking at, you're looking at the big picture here. And you know, don't be married to the, the specific AC ratio just yet because there, there again, is none for barbell sport athletes. Steph, what do you think about all that? I'm actually really, this is an area, again, I'm excited to learn more about. Um, Jared sent me a bunch of resources. Thank you, Jared. Um, no problem. But, but what I think I've gotten most out of it thus far is, is yes, there's not, it's, it might be a strength and a weakness in the system itself. I think that it is sort of adaptable to different sports 
even though specifically barbell is not as well defined as some of the field sports. Um, so I think that could, in my mind, end up being a strength of it um, as they kind of play around with it being a little bit more objective. But I think that one of the things that I've used with some patients that are more um, power lifters or, you know, not necessarily field or endurance sports athletes is talking about, you know, like Gary, when you said you have to sometimes regress a little bit or whatever, and if they're familiar with, with training loads a little bit, sometimes explaining to them that even though we're regressing, we're still contributing to building up the chronic load. And then that's going to make you a little bit more, I guess, adaptable or in, in the future, um, reducing your risk a little bit that way. Because sometimes people don't want to hear, okay, let's go back to this or let's, let's regress a little bit, especially, um, athletes that are working at like, you know, I want to reach, 80 percent on our end for whatever it is mm-hmm. um so it's tough because like we don't have all that data for barbell athletes but i think just using some of the concepts for now as we're learning more about it um can be helpful to reframe it for them but also explain to them that we're using this mix of subjective objectives um of a system to help progress them while decreasing their risk mm-hmm. just you you said it there i was going to mention it if you didn't, but it's, it's hard to get that buy-in, you know, Hey, we're going to, we're going to pull back. And the person's mm-hmm. like, no, that's, that's the opposite of what I want. And you have to sell them the fact that, like, we, we need to do this so that you can be better. If anybody's not familiar, the uh, Instagram account frustrated strength coach is fantastic. Uh, yeah. and it reflects a I'm lot of my life. Out. Oh yeah. You should check that out. It reflects a lot of my life as a PT, as well as a strength coach. I've appreciated it more over the years. But, uh, but yeah, that buy-in's hard sometimes. 